Good day, this is Tubal Cain again, and this is part three of this four part series entitled Making a Compound Rest for the Tiny Little Craftsman Lays. So I progressed this far so far so far. I'd be sure and go back and watch the other videos, the first two if you haven't seen them, but I've I've cut the dovetail and the slot and now I'm ready to start the T slot. For the tool post but in observing this thing and examining it I'm realizing that there is a step on here now this is so mutilated here it's hard to tell but the height right here is considerably different than right here so I'm going to cut a step and to confirm that, I was, I'm really trying to figure out what this thing looks like. And here in the 1948 catalog, Sears catalog, you can see that there's a bit of a step there. So let me lay that out. Using the height gauge, I'm transferring this dimension directly from uh, this compound onto my compound blank and I scribe it like that and then as far as the length is concerned I also took that right off of this as, as well as I could and made a mark there so in other words that step is going to look like that I will mill that material off right now over at the bridge port that's Henry doing all that banging up there. And here I go, machining the step. it on that back to the bench to do the rest of the layout for the t-slot now I told you that I don't really make a drawing but sometimes I make a little sketch so I've got some dimensions here that I made on a real crude drawing as to the uh, uh, dimensions of the t-slot but uh, all that's really necessary here is for this tool post to fit in there like, like this and this is so uh, bunged up munged up it's really hard to get a, a measurement off of it but it goes like that and the tool post itself is uh, 5 8 in diameter I believe it was 5 8 or was it 3 quarter a 3 quarter in diameter so I'll use a 3 quarter end mill to make that e initial slot and I'll take the depth right off of this and transfer it over to the new piece and then I need to locate the t-slot on here simply by taking it off of here so let me do that off off camera yet another day yet another year yet another decade has passed and I still don't need my college algebra what was it for because this was a semi-difficult layout and I certainly needed none of that but I did some transferring here but there is the layout ready to go over to the milling machine I, like I said I will start by using a, a three-quarter diameter end mill making the slot all the way across and ultimately to the depth here of the lower line so that uh, forms the basis of the t-slot you, you don't go right in with uh, a cutter like this you need a slot to get started so uh, that's a, that's what I'll do and then after that slot is made then 
I'll go in with the, uh, uh, th this is really a Woodruff cutter. Let me talk a little bit about cutters and T-slots. I really have quite a few of these Woodruff cutters, but only one T-slot cutter, and they are not the same. A Woodruff uh, cutter looks like this, but you can certainly make slots with it as well. But th this is a T-slot cutter, and you can see that it cuts it has cutting teeth right here where my fingers are as well as on the periphery and I believe that this one is called a stagger tooth cutter but it will not do because it doesn't have the diameter that I need to get into the slot without touching the shank but that's the general idea and these are quite costly and I am very hesitant to order a fifty or seventy dollar cutter just to, to, to for one project so I'm going to use this 3 16 thick and 3 quarter diameter cutter and that will go in like that after the initial cut is made however um, it is not the right thickness this way so I'll go in all the way with one pass and then I will change the position of the table and uh, raise it up and, and do the other one and then move over and do the other side so that's how we go about making a T-slot, something I don't do very often. And it has to accommodate the tool post like that. Let's go over to the bridge port again. That's a three-quarter end mill and I'm running it at 11.15 RPM. So that three-quarter end mill will determine the width of the slot. I'm repeating myself, I know. And even though I have a layout there, I have determined that the, the actual depth here is 410,000. So I'm going to feed in with the, the knee crank on that. I've already touched off and zeroed out the graduated collar on the knee. And I've locked the table in the X direction. I'll be feeding in the Y. And I have locked... The quill, always lock the quill so it can't move, and uh, simply going to be moving back and forth now in the uh, Y direction until I go 410 thousandths deep. Talking a little too much here. And I have, I have located it already this way in regards to uh, my layout, just visually. Make sure you got your safety glasses on, those chips are really flying. I got mine on. Fairly sharp cutter. Now I'll raise it 50 thousandths and feed back. This is a high speed steel cutter, not carbide. Now this is the last pass, just taking off 10 thousandths. Sometimes I hold a plastic shield over like this when the chips are coming toward me. This is a finishing cut, only 10 thousandths. Now I'll clean up here a little bit and take a measure with that depth micrometer. Okay, and I'm within two or three thousandths of the four hundred and ten thousandths which is the depth then that'll suit me just fine now to switch cutters and put the uh, Woodruff key seat cutter in a collet I have mounted that three quarter inch diameter key seat cutter that is three sixteenths thick in the half inch collet and remember I'm still on center from uh, cutting with this 
And since this cutter is the same diameter as this one, I'm centered perfectly within the slot. How convenient. Then the next thing I do is to come down and I just touch off without the uh, machine running. I'm still at 1100 RPM, did I say that? So I just bring the quill down until I just feel it touch and lock the quill. Now I'm going to back it out and I need to machine two hundred thousandths on this side of center and two hundred thousandths on that side and since my uh, DRO is at zero right now that's going to be pretty easy to do. Since I'm going to machine off of this side I will move the table in this direction, uh, 50 thousandths, and I'm watching the DRO for that. There are 50 thousandths, and lock the table in the X direction. A little power. Fifty thousands at a time, and you can see that the cutter is reasonably sharp. Now another fifty thousands. spoke a moment ago I'm cutting on this side I previously said I'm going that way but I'm going this way and now the final pass on this side side which I said I was doing before but now I'm really going to do it so I'm feeding in the X axis back to zero and then another 50 thousandths past that. Got a few chips in there yet. Now I'm conventional milling. Just make sure your cutter is good, good and tight so it does not uh, slip in the collet and spoil the work. You'd really hate to ruin a workpiece after there's so much time invested and material as well depending on what you're doing. and that brings us to the uh, correct width. Now I'll 
stop and uh, check some dimensions. All right, the T-piece starts uh, to go in, but as I told you earlier, the, the uh, thickness, the dimension right here, to accommodate this is not sufficient. It is uh, 187 thousandths, and I really need 215 thousandths, according to what this is. So, to uh, achieve that, let me show you what I'm going to do. I am now dropping the table by 20 thousandths. And I'm looking at the graduated collar on the knee in order to do that. Could be done up here with a quill too. And I did not change uh, the X location because uh, I'm only taking off, what is it, uh, 20 thousandths, which isn't very much. Let me get a little Earl in there and uh, I'm going to take it all in one pass. That's on this this side now. I hope you understand what I'm doing here. That changes the dimension of that slot by 20,000. Now I need to go over on this side. So looking at my digital readout, I am moving the table in the X direction back to the zero mark and then 200 thousandths past that. And it's so handy to have a digital readout because you just know the exact location. And again, don't take your work out until you're finished. Don't let your, your brush get caught up by the cutter. clean up and check it. The proof is in the pudding. Somebody corrected me on that once. The proof is in the taste of the pudding or something like that. But see how that fits in there? Just nicely now. Not a whole lot of slop, but it doesn't matter uh, if it's a little wider. And I'm probably a little bit under the dimensions of the original. But I don't care because the tool post fits and it fits nicely. Also, I wanted to make sure that the ring fits on there properly, and it does, because I was a little concerned about the location of this shoulder. I'm meaning right in here by the tip of the pencil. Would the ring go down there, or would it strike it? Because some of my dimensions there were bagasse and bagash, remember, because I was taking them off of this mutilated piece. But... There's a piece of cardstock, and it fits in there nicely. You know, it's important to remember when you run a lathe that you do not bring the tool post out like that. And some people do that either by carelessness or they, they need to reach. But that puts undue strain on, uh, on this, especially when it's cast iron. That's what causes those to break out. Plus, they're putting too much muscle on it. Now, if the... Uh, tool post did not fit, it would be easy enough for me to relocate it because I have not taken the work out of the vise and I have not changed the, the DRO setting so I could go right back in there and take off three thousandths or five thousandths or whatever I needed if it was necessary but of course it's not. And I know I've been preaching about not taking anything out so that's enough on that. Now one thing that troubles me a little bit is that th there's so many sharp corners and edges on this because it's not a casting 
and I intend to break a lot of those corners in the last episode to reduce that but I do not like this I, I'm a bit troubled by this so I was just looking through my cutters and you recall that recently I received quite a generous gift from Niagara Cutters but among the cutters there is this one and it's called if you look on here uh, a chamfer cutter look at the geometry on there I'm not even sure what you call this other than maybe scallop but if you look right here at the corners what I intend to do is install this in the spindle and try to come across here and chamfer that corner. It'll look better and save the knuckles at some point. You may have heard the pitter-patter of little feet upstairs. and That's my little Henry and at first I thought I need to wait until he goes to sleep before I do this this video but uh, now that I'm a granddad, I've, I find that actually comforting, even though it is probably disruptive <clears throat> to this video. But what I'm doing here now, I've taken a piece of uh, note paper, and uh, I, what I'm doing here is touching off. And I just bring the, the quill down until it just barely pinches that. I'll back it off so I can slide it out and then lock the quill. And then I'm ready to chamfer that, but perhaps I should just take an extremely light cut over that entire surface, and that would blend it in. We'll see how it goes. Here we go. And so on. Perhaps just a little more yet. I think that completes the job on the bridge port anyway. And that's what the chamfer looks like. Coming along. Now I'm breaking a few corners, just initially, in the bench press here with a nice sharp file. And I'll do a lot more of that later on, knocking off every corner, which will be a knuckle buster. Got just a little bit of a burr there and some burrs here. And let's take a look at it. Come on now, you have to admit it's starting to look like a compound. You know, when you look at this ring, you can see that the man that used it was even uh, using it upside down and had damaged it or worn it. You know, he didn't realize, I guess, that the, the wedge, where did I put the wedge, you know, belongs in the concave portion here. Oh well. So that goes on like that. Fits pretty nicely, don't you agree? Okay, that's all I'm going to do for today. In the final episode, I'll finish this up, and uh, that'll be part four. And what I need to do yet is to put the oil hole in. It should be right about there. That's simple enough. I have uh, two holes to drill here to hold that in place, hold the screw in place. And kind of a tricky thing to do here is to locate and drill and tap the four gib screw holes then clean it up a little bit round the corners put it on the lathe and try it out so that's what you'll see in the last episode thanks for watching this is Tubal Kane saying so long for now